Thank you, Brother David. Whew. Glory to God. Thank you. Oh, Denise, you turned my spiritual motor on this morning. That's one of my strongest messages. The veil has been torn, it's been opened. And now the Hebrew writer says, now we can come boldly, hallelujah, into the most holy place ever of heaven and earth, into the very throne room of God to find what? Grace, help, and mercy in our time of need. Do you know what's happening right now in that throne room? Right now. Jesus, Son of God, seated right beside the Father at his right hand, ever interceding for you. Our high priest, our advocate with the Father, our atonement for sin. He is sitting beside the Father where now the presence of God is as it was in the ark place on earth. It's where the mercy seat is. It's where the blood of the lamb has been sprinkled upon the mercy seat. And here's what happens. You or I have sinned this morning. The Holy Spirit has just convicted you so strongly. I'm sorry. I failed. I left you down. I did wrong. Will you please forgive me? Your advocate with the Father goes over to the Father and says, Father, my son, my daughter has failed this morning. They've sinned. My blood has been shed for them. It's right here on the mercy seat. I'm praying for them, interceding for them. Their high priest, will you forgive them? And the Father looks over to the Son says, forgiven, set free because of the blood of the Lamb and what you have done on that day. What a great gift. Not just the covering of our sin. He came to take away our sin. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ooh, that's, my, that's one of my strongest messages, and I'll never get over it. Um, Thank you, David, for inviting us here this morning. We fell in love with this church, big time. Made a lot of good friends here. We'll be with some of them today. Some of them have been with us. We're so thankful for this opportunity, for this new life church here. I had to think this morning. My message this morning is entitled, Lost and Found. And I had to think, the message I have this morning, it's, it's a little heavier. But I had to think with the passing of Terry here, a dear brother in this church, his name was Terry, right? Yeah. How God works sometimes. I believe what God was working through me, through the death of Terry, is going to come to you possibly, and maybe to the outside, as a setup. His death was a setup for this message. This is a message that's very deep, deep in my heart. And oh, um, it'll always be because I'm wired that way, and I'm called to that. Um, my message is going to be taken from Luke 15. Jesus gave three parables there. Lost sheep, lost son, a lost coin. I did a series of paintings on Jesus going after the lost and finding them. I would like to share some of them with you this morning. Our sister back there in the control room is going to try to project some of them paintings. Um, the first one I did was seeking the lost. I don't think she has that one. It was Jesus going after the one lost, leaving the 99 behind. The next one is lost and found. That which was lost was found. I did a painting on the lost son, the prodigal, legion, who was possessed with demons. Jesus went after that lost one, set him free, and he was found. The woman at the well came to get a drink that day and got a drink in that she never thirsted again. 
Nicodemus, good man, Nicky. But one thing you lack, you've got to be born again. When he was, we don't know, but he was born again, for he was there at the crucifixion. The last breakfast, after Peter denied three times and swore, I never knew him. The last breakfast, on the beach, Jesus sought after him and restored him. Zacchaeus, high up in a tree, come on down, for today I must abide with thee. They're all powerful images of Jesus seeking the lost. The Bible says Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Every year in the world, there's multitudes of people that die physically and spiritually because they're lost. Have you ever been lost? Ever lost? I have. It's a terrible feeling. I had to think of airplanes that fly into storms and there's no autopilot and the plane hits a mountain and the whole plane load is lost. I had to think of cars that, fly, that drive into fog. You can't see a thing. I use the, the term sometimes, lost as a goose in a fog. But all those people somehow end up in car crashes and many, many die. How many people die being lost hiking, no trail map, nowhere to go. Have you ever been lost at night in the dark? It's a horrible feeling. We have this thing today called GPS with this woman trying to talk to us. I don't think anything upsets me more than this. We have a motorhome. Behind our motorhome, we pull a Jeep. And when that woman is telling us where to go, and we end up at a bridge that we can't get through, can't get under, or somewhere else we can't get through, we have to stop the motorhome, and there's cars coming on behind us. I have to unhook the Jeep. Shirley has to back the Jeep out through this mess to find a place to turn around. And I have to back the motorhome out to find a place to turn around. There's another side to me, David, when those kind of things happen. You know what I say? Shirley, throw that stupid thing away. I get so upset with that. Go back to the original called a map. Mm. I tell her still, I, I say, Shirley, use the kiss method. Keep it simple, Shirley, and go back to the map. So how many people in this world today are on the wrong road being led by deceptive voices, not GPS, but voices of the world, voices of the enemy, going down the wrong road, the wrong trail, and they're lost as a goose in a fog. Our job as a church is to go after them, find them, and help them find their way and get them back on the road of truth where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want to read for you from Luke 15 where Jesus gave this parable. So Jesus used this illustration. If you had 100 sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you know the 90, wouldn't you leave the 90 and 9 and go after that one until it's found? And then you would joyfully carry it home on your shoulders to your friend, together with your friends and neighbors, to rejoice with you because you lost, your lost was found. That's my message here this morning to you. And to the world. I have a deep heart and concern for the lost in the world. There's a difference in being lost physically and lost spiritually. Lost physically, uh, it's for temporary. Lost spiritually, 
It's everlasting. It's eternal. And it never comes to an end. The worst feeling that I sometimes have ever gone through was when a dear friend, family member, someone I loved, got lost. I had that experience a couple years ago. Shirley and my birthday, three days apart, the end of September. And what we have done every year, just about every year, her and I go to a special place all alone. And here's how it works. Being a photographer, I know the hot spots pretty much in the country, the most beautiful places. I've been to them with my camera. Shirley is very good at doing the detail, making the arrangements to go, the lodging there. So a couple of years ago, coming up on our birthday, Shirley called me out in my art room and said, Glenn, where would you like to go this year for our birthday? So I said, you know what, Shirley? I've always wanted to go to Redfish Lake, Idaho, in the Sawtooth Mountains. I was never there, but it's a beautiful place. So she said, okay. So she made the arrangements to fly there, made the lodging there, got a beautiful little log cabin right on the beach of Redfish Lake. We got in there the end of September, and it was cold, very cold. The next day was my birthday. I got up that morning early. That's how I always work. I like ambient light to photograph with. So I got up very early before daylight, went out to my vehicle. The windshield was all covered with ice. I had to break that open. Loaded my camera equipment and took off. So here's how we work. I usually go out and photograph early in the morning, come back maybe about 8 o'clock, something like that, grab a bite to eat, Shirley and I spend a little time together, and then one of her gifts is she loves to find good trails to hike. She loves to hike and bike. So she found these trails there, so I came back, and uh, she wished me a happy birthday, and uh, we took off. So we were on a trail around the lake, and I was down there photographing. This was about 8.30 in the morning. I was down there photographing, and Shirley said to me, she said, look, she said, you're busy photographing. She said, why don't I just keep hiking around the lake? I said, yeah, fine. She said, I'll meet you back at the cabin shortly. So I photographed for about an hour or so, went back to the cabin. Shirley wasn't there yet. I didn't expect her. And I downloaded my, my, uh, my photographs onto a hard drive. Shirley still wasn't back. So I thought, well, I'll go grab a shower and something to eat. Now it's coming in to be 10.30. Shirley still wasn't back. So I started to get a little bit concerned. This isn't like her. So it got to be 11 o'clock. Shirley still wasn't back. So now I was really getting concerned. Come on, David. So I went down to the office. And I told them, I said, my wife went for a hike this morning on this trail. And we left about... 8.30, something like that. She's still not back. I said, I'm concerned. Well, he said, does she have a trail map with her? I said, no, we don't have one. He said, well, do you know how far it is around the lake? I said, no. He said, does she? I said, no. He said, it's 18 miles around the lake. So I got to thinking. Well, he said, if she's going the whole way around, he said, don't look for her till about 2 o'clock. So I went back to the cabin Two o'clock, Shirley still wasn't back. So I went back to the office again, and I told him, I said, no, uh, I'm really concerned about this. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I got a boat. He said, let's go in the boat. We'll run the circumference of the lake and see if we can locate her. And that's what we did. And the whole way he was boating around that thing, I was shouting out, Shirley, Shirley. No answer. So we came back from the boat ride. Shirley still wasn't back, and we didn't find Shirley. So now it's getting to be about uh, 3.30. He said to me, he said, no, uh, I think we better call the sheriff's department. Man, I was getting sicker by the minute. So shortly, the sheriff and all his deputies come pulling in. And he wonders what she looks like and all that when we left. And all of a sudden, I'm on the hot seat. He said, did you have a fight this morning? I said, no, we don't fight. 
He said, does she have mental problems? I thought, yeah, I think so right now. <laughs> no, I didn't. He said, does she have family, do you have family problems? I said, no, we don't. He said, what does she look like? So I was trying to describe it. What was she wearing? I said, I don't know. I said, I, I, I wasn't focused in on her clothing this morning. He said, well, that's unusual. I said, no. I said, I was interested in getting photographs this morning. I said, I'll tell you what, come up to my cabin. And I said, I'll show you a picture of her. So they did. All the deputies and he came up to the cabin and Noah, we looked at the pictures of Shirley. Okay, he said, we're going to search for her. I said, I'd like to go along. He said, no, you're not going along. He said, you're staying right here. So they were out there till just about 4 o'clock. Now the days are getting shorter. The nights are cold. And I knew she was not dressed to be out there overnight. My head was going, my mind was going, man of faith, filled with fear and doubt and wonderment. I'm thinking, did a predator get her? There's mountain lion, there's bear. Did some crazy guy on the trail attack her? Did she fall? Is she immobile? All these things are racing through my mind. And I'm getting that sick in my body. I, I can hardly operate anymore. My Shirley's out there. So what happened? The, sheriff's kind of, the sheriff and his team came back. No Shirley. He said, we're going to call in search and rescue. I said, what's that mean? He said, we're going to bring some helicopters in. He said, we're going to bring horseback riders in. And he said, we're going to go searching for her. I said, well, what's the chance of finding her? He said, we will find her. I said, I believe that, but how? So just the search and rescue was coming in. One of the deputies come driving down the dirt road, dust flying everywhere. He drove up beside me and he said, we found your wife. And I, I could have passed out. Just the way he said it, I thought, man, this isn't good. Why they do that, I don't know. So I immediately said, is she okay? He said, she's okay. He said, she's nearly back and she'll soon be here. Shirley arrived, and I'm going to be honest, I was so sick and weak and put out, I could hardly rejoice for her return. Shirley didn't think she was lost. She said, I was on that trail. She said, I knew it would bring me back again. To us, she was lost. There is a world out there on this trail of life. Let me back up. What happened to Shirley? She was out there hiking with the intent. I know I'll get back again. We had no phone service. And I didn't mention this one. I got on the landline there at the office and I called back home and told the children what were going on. The children didn't only say they're going to pray. They said, we're getting on a plane and we're coming out right away. And they rented a private plane and they were ready to leave to come out to help find Shirley. The desperation. She met a couple out there on the trail. What did they say to you, Shirley? I forget. Something about no service. Anyway, Shirley got back. She was safe. Here's my point. There are so many people in your neighborhood Friends of yours, in school, in the workplace, no matter where, they are lost. And they don't know they're lost. They think they're okay. They'll get through this thing. But to us, they are lost. To God, they are lost. And they need someone to care, a search and rescue party called the body of Jesus Christ. You are the search and rescue party. You are the deputy sheriffs of the great God in heaven, Jesus himself. And we need to be as desperate spiritually for people as we are 
for them bodily. Um, I, really, I really have a heart for this. I'm an evangelist, and I've done this most of my life. Um, my calling is to be a lifeboat for people, to bring people who are lost to safety into the kingdom of God. Several years ago, I had an experience with, the God, with my God and with the Holy Spirit. I was in my prayer time one morning, thinking of nothing like this, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, Glenn, he said, I called you to be a lifeboat for me, to bring in the lost, the fish. He said, you have, and I said, I have tried to do that all my life. And then the bomb, the bomb was dropped on me. He said, Glenn, make sure sight and sound doesn't become more of a showboat than a lifeboat. And that was a knife in my heart. Come on, not just sight and sound. Churches today, the body of Christ. It was a knife in my heart. And I had to think, I don't sense this is happening. So I went to the children about it, some of the children. And I told them what the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and they, they got quiet. They said, well, Daddy, we, we don't think this is happening. In fact, we think it's going more the other way. I said, well, I don't know what it meant, but I said, I know it was for a reason. And I said, possibly it's just a yellow flag, a warning to keep the main thing the main thing. So sometime after that, I was praying again. Out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Glenn, he said, you're the, res you're the one that's responsible for this epic look, these mega shows. I said, I am. I said, I did it for a reason because I said, you deserve the best and all I can give you. He said, that's true. But he said, I want you to know the showboat part is okay. It becomes the bait to get the fish into the lifeboat. When I thought about that, I thought, boy, that's right on. I'll never forget one day I was walked into the upper level of the auditorium. It was at intermission. There was a man sitting on a chair up there, and I walked up to him and said, where are you from? He staged his sermons with a lamb, a soil, with a pearl, whatever he could get his hands on, he staged it. And in doing so, he said, thus their eyes and their ears were opened, and they believed. And I remember saying back then, Jesus, if it worked for you, I believe it can work for me. You know, we use different bait to catch different fish. And if you don't get a bite, you change bait. And if the fish throws the hook and the bait, you rebait, you go again. But what happens? We bait, throw the hook, and wait. The Holy Spirit then does the work. Like the atheist in that auditorium that day. I live in a farm, and I know what it is when predators come in and can clean an eighth of an acre of soybeans off one groundhog. And I have no mercy. <laughs> I bait the trap. And I've learned to know what bait to use for different predators and get rid of the enemy. I'm going to speak to you in John Luke 15 this morning, where Jesus spoke of the lost sheep. I have never seen a painting other than the one shepherd that's going after the lost one and finding it. I don't know if I heard a sermon other than that. As I was working on this message, I got a revelation from God. Why did that sheep leave the flock? Hmm. Why? That's not the nature of a sheep. I know. I've lived with sheep all my life. I have them in our shows. You try to separate a sheep from the flock, and you've got a, you, you got a job on your hands. They are community. They stay together. They don't leave. So why did this one sheep leave and get lost? I have several reasons. I wonder if it was because maybe the mother 
pushed it away when it went for milk. Or maybe the mother didn't have enough milk. I know that. I had to bottle feed many lambs because of that same reason. Maybe it looked a little different. Mm. A little bit of a different color. Maybe it had some spots on it. Maybe it was a little bit on the scrawny side. Remember, remember the saying, the black sheep of the family? Maybe it was just acted a little different. It was a little unusual and was pushed away from the feeding trough time after time after time, bullied, hurt, feeling not wanted, alone, and hurt so many times that it fled and went away to be with itself and get away from the rest. Maybe it was a fence hole where the grass was always greener on the other side of the fence, like the prodigal son. Never could get done looking for the hole in the fence to get to the other side somewhere else. Maybe it was a predator that attacked it and chased it, running for its life until it got lost. Couldn't find its way back. Whatever it was, it was lost and it was left to die I'm going to apply a spiritual application here for just a moment Shirley and I were raised in a culture where if you wanted to come to the love feast table you had to have your hair up with a covering on we were not, a, we were not permitted to go to movies no jewelry no dancing, no going to worldly events, what they called it. I remember when the Ten Commandments came out and Shirley and I was dating, we snuck off and went into the King Theater in Lancaster to watch the Ten Commandments. Sitting there that night, I remember Jesus, Shirley said, I sure hope Jesus doesn't come back tonight. That was the deep conviction that was in our spirits, in our hearts. I had some friends back then in my youth who went to an outdoor movie in Lancaster Skyview. The deacons in the church found out about it, went to the entrance of that theater, outdoor theater that night, waited till they come out, stopped them, and demanded that they come before the church the next morning and confess their sin. Some of them were so turned off by that they left the church and some of them also walked away from God and I don't know if they ever came back. Shirley had a grandpa, good man, went to the York Fair, was put out of the church. To this day, we're not 100% sure when he died, whether he came back to God or not. I pray he did. Those were some of the pushaways from the feeding trough that was in the church. And I am sad to tell you that still happens today. We live in a community called shunning, where somebody doesn't do exactly the way the church bylaws say, they're excommunicated. And if they want to come back and have a meal with their family, they are not permitted to sit at the same table with them. This is a church, praise God, that is on search, seeking to find and save those that are pushed away from the feeding trough, those who can't find food with mother anymore. Those who have been driven and hurt time after time and they need a shepherd to reach out, put them on his shoulders again and carry them. Just possibly, just possibly, that shepherd, the 99, the morning after being in the sheepfold with the shepherd overnight, 
The shepherd was counting his sheep as they were leaving the fold. 96, 97, 98, 99. Where is 100? 100 is missing. Come to that sheep. So with a heart of compassion and love, saying, that sheep is mine. I will not give up until I find that lost sheep. He takes the 90 and 9 out onto the hillside of green pastures and leaves them and goes in search for that one that belongs to him and belongs back into the fold. Possibly he searched through the night, through the storm, through the lightning, through the hail, through the wind, tired, just coming to the end of himself. Where is my sheep? Until he finds that one lost one. The Bible says when he found that one lost sheep, he put it on his shoulder carried it back to safety and back where it belonged again. We have a job to do, people. We are God's search and rescue party. Have we been that desperate, that determined to go through no matter what, to get that one that's on your heart, that one lost sheep? No matter what size, no matter what color, no matter what race, but I am going to get that sheep and bring him back into safety, into the arms of the Good Shepherd forevermore. In the green pastures, beside still waters, back to the table of God to eat with you. Amen. We're a skiing family. My wife and I have been skiing just about since we're married. Shirley is an excellent skier. She's a good skier. Some of our best times we have had skiing together on the mountains all over. One year, we decided to take our family. Our fa she taught the grandchildren, the girls, the grandchildren how to ski, and we're, we're just a skiing family. So one year, I think she arranged it. We took the whole family to Alta, Utah. Good skiing. When we got out there, the next day we skied the whole morning, and hard we skied. Came noontime, we went in for something to eat, and after lunch, the family said, we're tired. We're not going out this afternoon. We're going to ski. We're going to stay back here. I said, guys, I didn't come out here to sit in this room. I came out here to ski. I'm going out. So my grandson, Carson, about seven, eight years old, said, I want to go with Grandpa. My daughter Brenda, his mother, you are not going out with Grandpa. I said, come on, why not, Brenda? She said, I know how you ski. She said, I don't want him to get lost. I said, come on, you know I'm not going to ski wild with him. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to be careful that he doesn't get lost. So after a lot of talk, they agreed to let him go. So Carson and I got out on the hills on the slopes, and we were skiing maybe half the mountain for a while. And then I said, hey, Carson, you want to go to the top? Yeah, I said, I'd like to go to the top. I said, we'll bring an inter intermediate slope down, one that you can easily handle. I said, you'll love it. Yeah, let's go. So we got to the top, got off the, gun uh, got off the gondola, went to the map. And I said, Carson, here's the trail we're taking down. It's called Rock and Roll. I said, you look at this close. I said, we're going to get down part way, and there's going to be a Y. I said, rock and roll is going to go to the right. And I said, deer run is going to go to the left. I said, you make sure to take rock and roll if you're not behind grandpa and come down rock and roll. I said, there's a big sign there. Okay, I got it. So we took off and we were having a good time. I kept looking back. Carson's right on my tail. Got to rock and roll. Right before I got to rock and roll, I looked back. He was there. I cut off on rock and roll, went down a piece, looked back, no Carson. I looked back again, waited and waited, no Carson. Sick feeling again. So I took my skis off and I walked part of the way up the hill. I couldn't find him. So by now I'm really getting sick. What do I tell Brenda? 
<laughs> so I decided to ski down to the lift. I went in the little house there to one of the ski patrol. I said, hey, guy. I said, I got an issue here. I said, it's a big one. I said, I have a grandson up here either on rock and roll or deer run. I said, I don't know where he's at. I said, would you please send two guys down from the top and try to find this boy for me? He said, yeah, we'll do that. So I waited there at the, house, at the shack for a while. No Carson, no Carson. So after I walked over to the house again, I said, did you send guys down? He said, yeah. He said, they didn't find him. Well, I said, he's got to be there somewhere. So after a long time of waiting, here I saw this little guy come down around the bend with a red cap and a red coat, and it was Carson. And he came up to me and with skis on E3's arms around me. He said, oh, Grandpa, am I ever glad to see you. I said, not as much as I'm glad to see you. I said, what in the world happened to you? He said, well, right before rock and roll cut off, he said, there was a bend there. And he said, I fell, my skis came off, and he said, I couldn't get them on again. And he said, you kept going. I said, I was looking for you, but I couldn't find you. You were around the bend. Here's the point. I did say this to him. I said, do you want to go home or do you want to keep skiing? I want to keep skiing, he said. So we got on the chairlift. We were going up, and he looked over at me, and he said, Grandpa, he said, isn't God good? I said, is God ever good? He said, you don't know how much I was praying that I would find you. And he said, God, help me find you. I said, amen. So it was a great lesson for all of us. Here's the message. What would have you thought or what would you think of me if I would have said, he'll find his way back. Somebody else will find him. He'll be okay. Uh, he should have listened on me. Didn't he hear what I told him at the top of the mountain? I came out here to ski, not look for a lost grandson. I'm here to enjoy myself. What are our thoughts toward those who are out there on this trail of life, lost, not just for today, but for eternity. Do we have enough compassion, as did Jesus, to seek and to save that which was lost? People, it's harvest time. Jesus says, lift up your eyes and see. The fields are white for the harvest. I remember as a boy, Daddy used to go out late June, early July into the wheat fields. Coming harvest time, the fields were white, gold, and then turned white. He'd take wheat in his hand, a head of wheat, and he'd wrap it around, blow the shaft off, bite the kernel. It's not ready. He'd go back the next day, the next day, until he took a bite of that kernel, and it's hard enough. It's harvest time. Everybody in the neighborhood came together to save the harvest. Over a year ago, I had a large group of Chinese come through my art gallery with an interpreter. Standing at the crucifixion painting, the one Chinese woman started wailing out loud. And then the man, the interpreter, looked at me and he said, stop, Glenn. He said, this woman just told me she wants to give her heart to this man on the cross, Jesus. I said, praise God. She was a, a Hindu. I got a, I got a message two days later saying, we're baptizing that woman today. Eventually, she was involved with the Chinese church in Lancaster, was attending five Bible studies a week. After that, she went back to China. Her husband got saved. They founded an underground church. Her son is at the Lancaster Bible College studying to be a minister. And the power, I administered this here some time ago, of multiplication. 
when you put one seed into the ground, it went to China. It went to an underground church. That's the power. When you put forth the effort to seek and to save that which was lost, use your ability, your gift, whatever. We all do it in different ways. Like I said, we all have different bait in our box. All we're called to do is use it. I'm just about done. Now, i got to tell you this. The power of multiplication. Can I do this yet, David? Labor Day weekend, Sight and Sound decided to take the Daniel show and put it through a company called Fathom into theaters all over this country, but do it live. Our, our granddaughter headed this thing up. So they brought in these big HD trucks in back of the auditorium, probably $20, $30 million a piece. Our grandson was calling and directing 13 high-end cameras in that, in that uh, auditorium. Shirley and I were sitting in that auditorium filled with people. While he was calling the shots, the sound was being sent down to our neighboring barn, which is renovated, where our sound rooms are. The sound people were taking that soundtrack, formatting it into a way that it could go into theaters with sound, surround sound. After that happened, it was sent to Lidditz to Tate Towers that then sent it by link to LA, California, where they formatted it in a format that could be sent to satellite. That was then sent to Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Nevada, which sent it to the satellite in the heavens. The satellite sent it to 900 and some theaters in every state in this country. And 30 seconds after it left the sight and sound stage, over 200,000 people in this country with eyes and ears were hearing and seeing the gospel and the story of Daniel in times such as this. It's the power. So, thank you. But that's not the end of the story. I sat in the auditorium and I cried because I remembered one projector in 1965 to 100 people. Here's my closing. I give you this to finish with. I want to ask you a personal question. I ask it to you in love, but with deep concern. Are you ready? Don't look to the neighbor next to you. Have you ever led one person to Jesus Christ? I'm not accusing, I'm asking. If so, praise be to God. I was rejoicing in heaven, thank God, for that one lost soul. One soul is worth more than all the world. If not, where the rubber meets the road. Let me give you this in closing, thinking about Terry. God came to Noah, build an ark. It's going to destroy the earth. It's going to flood. You and your family, two of every kind, should be saved. Gave a little bit of instruction, walked away. 120 years, building and working and struggling to build that ark. Not once did God speak. The ark was complete, ready for occupancy, as he'll often do with us. He will not speak again until we finish what he asked us to do. He built the ark. Noah, seven days, and it's going to rain. You, your family, and two of every kind get in that ark. I ask the question, why seven days? Sometimes people who are dying of cancer and know they have one month to live, three months to live, have a whole different mindset toward things spiritually. Maybe you know somebody. This is the day of salvation. Today is the day. The door to the ark of Jesus Christ 
is going to be shut as it was in the days of Noah. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be again in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. It will be shut. After it's shut, it's over. There's no more in, there's no more out. If Terry could come back and tell you what it's like after death, this whole church would have a whole different mindset. I've often said, if the dead across the board, saved, unsaved, could come back and tell you what it's like, we'd have a different world to live in today. I'm asking you all, please, commit to one person. That's our job description, people. That's what we're called to do. I know we don't know the day nor the hour, but I can guarantee you and tell you this one thing. We are closer right now than we have ever been before. Father, thank you for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And thank you, Father, for that burning desire you are putting into the hearts of people right now to go out and tell. You gave us a mouth. You gave us a tongue. And if nothing else that we can tell, we can tell them of what you have done for us. And what you have done for us, you will do for them. And no matter what you are going through in life, there is a pill that can remedy, save, and deliver you from anything called the gospel. Jesus Christ. So help us to be bold enough, courageous enough, determined enough to go searching and seeking that which was lost. Bring them in to the sheepfold of Jesus Christ into everlasting life. Thank you for this church, for the voice of this church in this area and to wherever it may go. Bless them, Lord. Be gracious unto them. Lift up your countenance upon them. Make your face to shine upon them. Give them peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Shalom. In Jesus' name. Thank you and amen. Thank you. You're the Lord, I is ravish my heart.
to we are in the most serious business in the world as believers we have life and God calls us to give life out I wonder if you could just think of one person right now one person that you love one person that you know maybe even someone but you know that they need Jesus. Just take one. Commit to praying. Commit to reaching. Be salt and light. Because what waits us, what awaits us on the other side, is beyond our understanding. I, uh, I heard a story, I know we're all heard it regarding Terry Still. I know that We've cried a lot in my house. I know that many others have as well. But I heard a great story. Glenn Kaufman told me that somebody contacted him. He said he had a dream or a vision. Didn't know which it was. But he said that he saw Terry in glory. Saw him in heaven. And his back was to him. He was walking toward the light shining before him and in the perfect Terry way Terry says oh you gotta see this we we get to see it bring some Bring someone else who doesn't yet know. Father, I pray for an evangelistic spirit to break out in this house. I pray that we, Lord, with all the things that we do and all the things that we enjoy in this, this world and in, in this life and, and even in this church, Lord, the good services we have and the great speakers like Lord, let us not get distracted from why we exist, that we exist to preach the gospel to every creature, to make disciples of every nation, to cause them to obey the things you taught. Lord, let us not lose track in all of our enjoyment of the things you've given us in the one thing that we're called and created to do. Lord, let us become like never before. church that Lord God our heart beats for the people for the lost people that surround us in Jesus name if you want prayer if you need prayer come on up and get it but let us leave here today committed to reach at least one person because there's nothing